And we like our fluid relationship with the world. The flows, the seepage, the sweat, the perspiration, the rushes of blood, the waves of emotion, eye-watering, mouth-watering. When the body gets going, things can get pretty messy. Even stranger is how we perceive the matter of liquids and solids when most of what we are is actually blank space. The atoms that make us up, water and all, actually take far less space than the comparatively vast distances between them. How we don't just fall apart into an ever disintegrating world of unattractive and relatively meaningless bits of atomic particles is one of the greatest of mysteries about life, the universe, and everything. That and the paradox that if the space between all the atoms that make us up is far greater than the space those atoms themselves take up, then why can't we walk through walls? Or have no fear of bullets because they just whistle straight through us, missing all the vital organs and other anatomical stuff. <laughs> I'll tell you why. It's because someone invented quantum physics. <laughs> and in quantum physics, all you need to know is that each and every electron and particle and quark, neutrino, whatever, can exist in more than one position at a time. Which means they, and by association, you and I, are all over the place. Which I have to admit is how I feel most of the time. So it's not as crazy as it sounds, I guess. Although, to be in more than one fixed position at the same time means everything has to be in more than one dimension. But we, that is us here and now, are all stuck in this crappy, boring dimension where the best we can do is think, well, the space between all the atoms that makes us up is far greater than the space those atoms take up. <clears throat> Why can't we walk through walls? <laughs> Which is quite a frustrating dimension to be stuck in. Because we can talk all we want about making quantum leaps, but it's just talk. We are stuck here while all the really teeny weensy little bits that make us up get to travel between dimensions and time and don't have to obey the laws of physics, quantum or otherwise. Nor do they have to pretend to understand and try not to look stupid when scientists say that this multi-dimensionality, how long is a piece of string theory of everything thing, is a perfectly reasonable explanation. Yeah. On a more earthy note, wet is used to describe conservative or Tory politicians. It was very popular during the 80s. Many ministers got moist at the thought of the very dry to the point of arid Mrs. Thatcher. <laughs> wet has become synonymous with negative attributes, being wet behind the ears, putting the dampers on things, although the dampers actually alludes to brakes, which can skid dangerously when wet. Then again, being on the skids isn't so great. Neither is being on thin ice or up shit creek, muddy waters, being washed up, pissed, meaning either at the end of a liquid lunch or simply lazy shorthand for being pissed off, sometimes both. Probably has its roots in early forms of text messaging, twittering, blogging, frogging, dogging, I mean, who knows how many other dingling innuendonics have been stored up in the sea of liquid metaphors that seems to continually wash up on the shores of our contemporary linguistic protocol. The mess we've gotten into since watery sex was invented <laughs> is enough to bring a tear to your eye. Tears of sadness, tears of joy. Our bodies just lap water up and secrete it out nonstop. It's like this constant flow. Our skin isn't armor-plated or anything. It's not like a damp-proof membrane. Human skin is just barely enough to keep everything held together in the first place. We're all soaking up and leaking everywhere all the time. Human skin has evolved like those breathable fabrics that self-obsessed cycling fanatics spend their entire evenings talking about along with the latest generation of performance-enhancing hormones that can't be detected in blood tests. <laughs> Soaked, sozzled, drenched, look what Kitty dragged in from the raining cats and dogs, drizzling mud fight of a drowned rat's ass floating in a sea of word associations, which always gets me thinking, what is it about dog innuendonics that so captures the British imagination? I mean, metaphors like dog's bollocks, meaning wonderful, <laughs> or dog's breakfast, meaning pukey. How many aisles of supermarket shelves are devoted to animal byproducts, comprised mostly of water, sold to animal lovers as pet food? They are loosely labeled meat, like chicken flavored meat, tuna flavored meat, or caviar and lobster flavored meat. 
an unnecessary marketing ploy that does little to flatter the contemporary pet owner. For instance, if you really want a dog to go for its food, just label it table scraps and wipe its bowl with your own bodily excretions before you <laughs> fill it with dry food so they think you are sharing something you killed with your bare hands with them. <laughs> Down boy. This tactic also provides the owner with some vengeful satisfaction, getting their own back for having to pick up dog poo every time they go for a walk, <laughs> carefully collecting it into little plastic bags where it will fester and mutate in its own primordial juices for the next <laughs> 10 years or so. Buried in some brownfield landfill site, earmarked for a suburb of affordable homes being built by property developers looking for a fast buck and sea views for the second and third home owning tax exile clients who need something to spend their bankers bonuses on. Where was I? <laughs> One of the big things prior to religious monocultures like Christianity and Islam, Buddhism and so on, was blood sacrifice. That's what everybody talked about. That was the real deal. After all, nobody cries over spilt milk, but even today, spilt blood gets the juices flowing. Especially amongst the vampire community, an often unrepresented and much maligned minority. <laughs> bloody vampires! They come over here, take all our bloody night shifts. Not one of them's done a day's work in their life. Nothing but a bunch of parasites. Garlic's too good for them. Keep British blood for British blood, suckers! Actually, I wasn't going to mention blood at all in relation to wet, because it just seemed too obvious and emotive. Our pulses racing, rivers of consciousness floating your boat, well lubricated going with the flow. But water is something central to this thing called life. We start out single-celled. It's fluids that smooth the flagellating flow of the little spermatozoa up the birth canal to meet the egg embedded in the blood-gorged womb wall. Somehow we grow from being a fertilized cell swimming in our mother's expanding belly pond of embryonic fluid. And finally, nine months later, we emerge as a quite sophisticated, but nevertheless pretty basic, water-filled balloon of skin. But let's just shed a single-celled parent's tear of farewell and bid a damp adieu to this stream of innuendonic consciousness as it flows back into the primordial cesspool from whence it began, as we come to the towel-tossing end of yet another episode of Unspoken Words. My fluid is Mac Dunlop, and thanks for pouring in. <laughs> Bye for now.